All right, welcome to CS 4510, lecture eight, uh, first half on Thursday. Uh, today's topic is on uh, Turing machines. Today is going to be, so today is really the first day of class. We had 16 videos or eight lecture days on all of the regular languages and the context-free languages. Last time, if you recall, we proved that every PDA has a CFG. And we did a simulation by a automata on a grammar, which was kind of non-trivial. And then we proved the non-regular, excuse me, non-context-free languages exist, and that they are using a very complicated pumping lemma style argument. Um, all of that, so we're done with the unit on context-free languages. We're done. Uh, someone else could spend more time on it, but I like to speed run through those things to get to the interesting stuff, like today. Today, in some sense, is the first real lecture of the course. None of that, none of that mattered. All of that was just all warm up to get into the science, and now we're in the science. So now is the first day of class. Uh, it's not a warm up anymore. Um, so Turing machines are probably the most important and most interesting kind of automata there is, and we will spend the rest of the class on them in many, many different ways. But we're going to spend several lectures, actually, on the definition of a Turing machine, because it's very important, it's very foundational. We'll also talk about Alan Turing as a person and his work, like, in general. Um, so first off, what was like the limitations of a PDA? So recall like a PDA. Uh, we had a push down automata and it had, we gave, basically we realized that there were limitations of a DFA or an NFA and then you can only keep track of finally many things at once and then you take, so we gave it a, an infinitely large growing memory structure which is, it can only use, it as a stack it can push things to and pop things from but if it has to keep pushing certain things in order to reach deep into the stack, it was unable to, it's unable to read deep into the stack arbitrarily long without popping things out. And if it pops things out, it has to forget it. So let's kind of, this is sort of a weak data structure, but there's another data structure. Let's give a, a, a DFA like a different data structure. What's, the, what's a different data structure other than a stack? A queue. Is there, there's that, That'll be correct in a more complicated way we don't know yet, but is there a different, what's a, what's a different data structure? Even simpler one. Array. An array. We're just going to give, a Turing machine is quite literally, you give a DFA an array. That's basically it. Um, literally, I mean, that's literally what it is going to be. And I have this picture of a Turing machine I show everybody. So you can think of it like a PDA has some set of states. It also has some set of states. So it has something like this. You know, of course, there's going to be some start state. Something like this. Yeah, and somehow it's able to read uh, and write to this uh, That's my picture of a Turing machine. Basically, there's some sort of DFA-like structure, and it's able to iterate over an infinitely long tape. Um, and each tape contains a cell, and each cell contains a symbol. Something like this, right? So this is my picture of a Turing machine. It, uh, there's some device here. There's some sort of states. It has a, what's called a tape head. So the tape head is a, has access, local access, to a small part of the tape at any given moment. And we fix that small local access to just be one. It can read and write to one cell at a time. And then it's allowed to move left or right over the tape. So an array, you're allowed to jump and do things. Uh, there will be differences between other kinds of comp computers and Turing machines. But this is a, the, sort of the limitation of a Turing machine. A Turing machine is, can move, read, and write. That's it. Three instructions. It's a three-button typewriter. Uh, it seems ridiculously simple, but we'll, we'll, we'll spend the rest of the class, not just the class today, but the class itself, discussing the power of Turing machines, because everything's about a Turing machine. So now, to give you the formal definition, uh, 
It's going to be Q uh, sigma gamma. Oops, that's an F. Uh, delta uh, Q0, uh, QA, and QR. And unlike the PDA and the DFA, we'll spend a lot of time actually talking about why this definition is good. So Q, uh, some of this maybe just seems like patterns uh, at this point, is a finite set of states. Uh, sigma is a finite input alphabet. Uh, gamma is a finite tape alphabet. So like the PDA has a, a tape as an input in a stack alphabet, the Turing machine has a finite input and a finite tape alphabet. And by like we have a convention for the um, PDA, we also have a convention for the um, tape alphabet here, where we say we're usually just going to take gamma to be sigma uh, union the special symbol, which we call a blank. Does that show up on the camera? It looks like that. Uh, it's basically a blank, and we use a blank to differentiate than an underline. And I think, it, like in latex, this is like uh, text of visible space, something like this. It's a, or like square cup, right? Something like that. Basically, uh, we'll talk about the, the importance of the blank as, uh, as well for the, for the machine's initialization. Oh, and of course the, of course the uh, transition function. I should mention here that the Turing machine is explicitly deterministic. So it uh, goes from a single state, it reads a symbol off the tape alphabet. Let me make sure I get this exactly right. It reads a symbol off the tape. And then it's going to move to a new state. It's going to write a symbol. And then it's going to decide it's going to reset its head to move left or right. So here LR is an instruction for the machine to move left or the machine to move right. Q0 is a special start state. QA and QR are accept reject states. Um, as defined in the definition, the QA and QR are special because they don't have outgoing transitions. The machine, unlike the DFA where you have to stop at any moment, here the Turing machine has to issue the special instruction to stop. The Turing machine has to, there's an instruction the machine has to call to transition to the state and, and in order to stop. This is what differentiates it really from a DFA. So this is the formal definition of a Turing machine. This is a pictorial uh, image of a Turing machine. So we say the Turing machine computes. Um, uh, how does the Turing machine compute? So like, uh, what's the best way to word this? It's initialized. So the TM is initialized. With uh, W as its input, it's going to be W1, W W2, Wn on its tape. And the way the tape is going to look like is going to be like this, right? So the machine begins at the start state, Q0. The, something has written the, t the input on the tape for it in the leftmost squares. And this is just some convention we have here. But we have to have a convention, right? So W1, W2, W3, or so on. The head is pointing directly at W1, which is the first symbol of the input. Uh, anything that's not, the tape, though, is infinite, quote unquote. But the machine is allowed to loop over to those parts of the tape and read them. Write them, whatever. Those parts of the tape, though, contain this special symbol blank. That's why we use the blank. Basically, the input 
is written to the first cells of the tape, so W1, W3, W4, W1, W2, W3, W4, dot, 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 all the way to WN, that's written here. If it wants to read the input, it can just move left, excuse me, move right over the input and read it. Um, perform some computation on it. Uh, then the blanks are, are what everything that comes after that. Compared to like a DFA, is this kind of different in that a DFA, if you have a string of like A, 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 B, in order to get that B, you have to go through all of the A's. Why would this? It's kind of random access, and you can Absolutely. go straight to the B. So the word random access, though, it means something very... S in, in this class, really only, it means something very different. Okay. But not that. So just to give you a, 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 a hint here, random access means you can jump. A computer has a jump instruction. A Turing machine does not. So for example, you want to read the last symbol. Random access machine takes constant time. If you consider the number of steps, we haven't talked anything about time, but consider the number of steps a machine has to take as a function, okay? An input end to read the last symbol, r random access machine takes random access, talk constant time. Maybe it has to know the size of the input log time, whatever. The Turing machine is forced to loop over. The Turing machine has to take linear time. So it can't jump. Can't jump. Cannot jump. If it wants to read the cell, it has to move one step at a time to get there. We'll see very, very rigorously what the difference is between uh, these, and these and these kinds of things. Another thing to note, though, is like the DFA and the PDA um, had the input, and they could only read it left to right. And once they read it left to right, whatever they had previously seen, if they they were only allowed to store that in their memory structure in some way, and whatever they weren't able to store, they were forced to forget. Here, the machine can keep the input there. Maybe you can make a copy of it or something, and then then continue computing. So it's allowed to like go back and say, wait, what did I see? In this specific definition of a Turing machine, there are actually variants of definitions of Turing machines. We'll talk about those as well. So, um, so this is the definition and the picture of a Turing machine. Um, now, a Turing machine, it's useful for us to consider snapshots, instantaneous pictures of the Turing machine during a computation. So what we use is this notation of a, of a, of a configuration. And all a configuration is, is an instantaneous snapshot of the machine at a, at a certain step. Um, so like uh, if, uh, let's say your machine was like, uh, somehow there's something here and something here, and we were at like say A, uh, B, uh, C, and D, and let's say, let's say we were at some QI, and we were pointing at the C. We wanna, so what is a snapshot, what is, as a data structure, what is all the information to encode the snapshot, the state of the machine. It's all the things that are on the tape, the entire tape, except the, non, except the blank squares, which haven't been touched. It's the current state of the machine, and it's the position of the tape head. So it's like current tape, uh, current state, and it's the current head position. We want to know uh, what position this head is uh, uh, over the cell to know what, what, it, what it's doing at that instance. So the way we encode the configuration, again, not important, but we have to know what the convention is, is we just say, uh, we convert the snapshot of the machine into a string, where we, we encode all three things by just putting the symbol for the current state at its current position in the string. So this is some position of some machine at some moment. We, we, can, we say the configuration for this would be A, B, Q, I, C, D. So you have the tape, then you insert the symbol Q, I into the tape uh, such that the, the symbol right of it is where it's, the head is pointing. So here, the head is pointing to C. So we say C is to the left of this inserted Q, I. So this string is called a configuration, and this configuration represents the state of the machine at this moment. Uh, we can also do uh, sort of like a, like a uh, sequential steps of the machine. So let's suppose uh, we were at this state, and we read uh, uh, C, write uh, uh, C prime, and we move, say so we move right. Oh, and we should know the state. Go to QJ. Go, we'll say to QJ, right? 
So that's, that's one like atomic operation of the Turing machine. So what we would do is we would, we're in the previous state, we go from A, our configuration is A, B, Q, I, C, D. Well, if we read C, write C prime and move right, what we're going to do is, as a Turing machine picture, it's going to look like this. So we read C, write C prime, and then the head is going to move right, and we're going to be in QJ. So this is the, the, um, the next step of this partial execution of a Turing machine. This encoded would look like what? It would look like A, B, C prime, QJ, D, right? That's that configuration of that Turing machine. And we would say, um, we would say uh, one configuration yields another if it follows from the transition function of the Turing machine. So we say, uh, like, CI yield, and we use this special symbol, CJ, if CI, if CJ uh, follows from CI after one step of delta. So we may write here for these two configurations specifically, we may write like A, uh, B, a Q, I, C, D yields uh, A, B, C prime, Q, J, D, something like this, right? We say a Turing machine accepts a string. If uh, there exists a sequence of k configurations, uh, such that c0 is accepting, so, excuse me, c0 is initial, what does what an, an initial co configuration look like? It's going to look like as we define how the machine is initialized. So it's going to look like Q0, W1, dot, 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 Wn. So the initial configuration is initial, OK? Uh, CI uh, yields CI plus 1. So each configuration follows the next one. And CK, the kth configuration, is accepting. We say a configuration is accepting if the state of the configuration is the accept state, right? So clearly, if the machine, this, basically this is just, the Turing machine accepts if there exists a sequence of its computations of moves that it makes to reach the accept state on that word. Clearly kind of an obvious definition of what accepting means. But we have a formal definition of, of here, meaning the machine to accept means there exists a sequence of states. Right. Any computation to do something is simply, uh, at least with respect to the Turing machine, a sequence of these steps. So now let's actually give some Turing machines. First off, well, let's talk first off about the relationship between um, Turing machines and other classes of languages. What would you guys think the relationship between a Turing machine and uh, the context-free languages is? Similar to a DMI, so a context-free language is yeah, the Turing machine, then yeah, the context-free language around it. If that's what you're meaning. So we showed um, we proved uh, like L a DFA or L NFA or L a PDA. These were all the regular languages, and we showed that these were a strict subset of the context-free languages, L, C, F, G. But then we prove that the CFGs are equal in power to the PDA. So this is, we can also put PDA here. How would you think the circle of languages that the Turing machine has power over 
can fit into this uh, chart. Why is PDA in the regular? PDA, oh, good, the sh yes, Rex, great catch. Regular expressions. So the PDAs, we, the reason we showed this is we showed, you know, every DFA is a PDA, excuse me, NFA is a PDA or, you know, regular expression is a CFG or something like this. But then we showed languages that which, are, which were decidable by PDAs and CFGs, which were not decidable by um, DFAs, by the pumping lemma. Where would you guys think, if you just had to guess, where, given this tape data structure, like, how, how much power does this give relative to things that we've studied? Why? So I came a little late, um, so I don't know if this is right, but it seems like um, there's a lot more you can do because... How would you prove it? Um, Suppose you don't want to show it's strictly more powerful, but like at least more powerful. Um, so there's, it, um, like at least as powerful as a CFG. Sure. Um, so you have your states, you have an input alphabet and you have a tape alphabet. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe you can use that to simulate a PDA. How? Can you use that as a cube? Uh, there you sorry. go. Uh, pretend, pretend the, the tape is a stack. Okay? A stack is just like popping and pushing. Okay? You could probably pretend to do, you could imagine you could pretend to do that with a tape, right? Instead of popping, maybe you just delete and then move. Right, right. So this proves that every language decidable by a PDA is uh, decidable by a Turing machine. Right. Given that this definition means you know decidable. Um, right. So now let me give you an example of a language which we know is not context-free but is decidable by a Turing machine. So what that what that means is uh, the language is going to be uh, L W hash W. Uh, w in sigma. Now, when we gave the CFG for this language, there was no hash in it. And when we pumped it, there was no hash in it. Um, and the way, the reason we were OK with this is because the non-deterministic devices were allowed to just guess the middle. The definition of a Turing machine is explicitly deterministic. So I'm going to help it out. I'm just going to put the hash there. And this, is, this language is not context-free for the same reasons the other one was not context-free. Okay? Uh, the proof that this is not context-free would be almost identical. Uh, the symbol doesn't really change anything about the structure of the, of the, the power needed to decide this language. But by putting the symbol there, I can help the Turing machine so it doesn't have to brute force check guess where the middle of the string is or maybe do some pre, uh, work to find out the middle and then work with respect to that. Just by inserting it there, I'm going to help it out. So when you give a Turing machine, the best thing to do first is to give like pseudocode. Uh, then figure out what the state diagram is, uh, if at all. So, like, the idea is our tape is going to look like, let's say, like, A, B, A, A, hash, A, B, A, A, something like this, right? Maybe I'll put a B here, a B here, right? Something like this. The tape is going to be initialized like this. What is an algorithm in general? Forget the Turing machine part. What, what is an algorithm you would come up with to decide this language? Until you read a hash, you keep popping things in a stack. After pushing things into a stack, after you see the hash, you start popping them. So um, we don't have a stack. And we could implement that data structure on a Turing machine, but it'd be, it would be kind of complicated. What's a simple, like, fifth grade level programmer knows Python? What is, say, say, what are you doing? Say that. You go, like, literally character by character, like, OK, A. Okay, go. Okay. Okay, B. Okay, go B. Yes. We're going to start here. The head is going to start here. What we're going to do is going to cross it out, move here, check that it's the same, cross it out. Then we're going to go here. See that this is a B. Remember it. Cross it out. Go here. 
see the, make sure this is a B, cross it out and go there. Cross it out. Cross it out. See what I'm doing? That is an algorithm, technically, to decide this language. And it's going to only be correct if the, if the word looks like w hash w. So uh, to write this out in words, the idea is like, uh, uh, maybe I'll put it here. Like, we're going to mark the symbol, uh, keep track of it. How would we keep track of the symbol? You shouldn't get this one, I think. This was... So the Turing machine has two ways to keep track of something. It can write it down on the tape, or it can remember it in the states. So we're going to use the states to the, remember the states like a DFA can remember like a finite amount of things. We only need to remember if it was an A or a B, finitely many choices there. So we'll use the states to remember. Um, otherwise, we would have to write it down somewhere else. We, maybe we would see an A, go over here, write the A, and then check that this is the A, something like this maybe. Uh, it's too complicated. So we're just going to keep track of it in the states. And it'll make sense what that means when, I, uh, when we do the diagram. Uh, we're going to then, so we cross the A. We're going to loop past the hash and find the first unmarked symbol. So if uh, it equals what we stored, mark and uh, reset. That's sort of in words what the algorithm would be doing, right? We also need like a stopping condition. So So after we've marked every symbol, we simply can just say we accept. We'll have to have that in our diagram, but that's what we do. That's like the high-level idea. Now let me give you the picture. What does this say after W? Find, oh sorry, after first. Find first. Unmarked. Unmarked. Right, so we mark the symbol. How do we mark a symbol, by the way? Well, mark isn't crossing off. Yes, but a Turing, according to the definition, a Turing machine does not have a cross out instruction. If you progress the state, you would have to assume that's right. Mm, you could leave it un unchanged. It, let's do the example, I think. I think this would be instructive. We need to see, when I ask these questions, we need to be able to know what we're talking about because we haven't seen the example yet. Right? So first off, we have to start at Q0, okay? That's like the, the given. Um, the instructions are going to look like this. So we need to read, write, move, right? According to the transition function. So we do this like this. We, we say uh, read, uh, write, move. That's what we do. So we say read A, write B, move left or right. That's what we're going to do. So first off, if we see an A or a B, and the transition function, of course, for the Turing machine, unlike the PDA or the NFA, the transition function for the Turing machine is deterministic. So we want to read and we want to write. Uh, we want to read and write. Um, If we, we want to conditionally do something different if we see an A or if we see a B, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say we read an, if we read an A, uh, write something, and then move right, or if we see a B, write something and move right. Now, I asked what does it mean by marking? Sim Turing machine doesn't have a mark symbol. That's OK. We can just make up a new symbol pretend it's the marking symbol. Marking a symbol is the same thing as writing over it with some other symbol. So we're just going to use the letter X to represent a marked symbol. 
right? So read A, write X. And then if we ever see an X again, we should just know by the convention we've set, we previously marked it, because it was not, it didn't show up anywhere in the input. Is there a reason you wouldn't use the kind of underlined character? This, the blank space, we want it to be special for something else. It's a delimiter. We can use that to test for the end of the input. So we could reuse it, but then... Exactly, exactly. We can use it for, exactly. Or like a total erasure, erasure right? Um, right? So now we've seen the A, we've written the X. So again, the input is going to look like A, B, A, A, B, hash, uh, A, B, A, A, B. Something like this, right? And then these are going to be blanks infinitely. So we're here. We mark the A, and then we want to do what? We want to loop past anything until we see the hash. When we see the hash, we want to switch our brain mode to now begin marking. So we're going to uh, loop past any A uh, or B. So I'll write it this way. If we see an A, how do you, the Turing machine does not have an ignore symbol. It does not have a loop past instruction. But we can implement that using the instructions of the Turing machine anyway. So ignoring a symbol is the same thing as reading it and writing it back. So we're just going to do that. If we see an A, write that A and move right. Or if we see a B, write that B and move right. So we're just reading these symbols, writing them back. Same thing as ignoring it. It's uh, not destructive. Now, if we see a hash, though, we see a hash, we're going to write the hash back and move right. So, so far, what we've done is we've seen the A, written the A, and we'll copy this for the bottom branch. Uh, then we've skipped past all the inputs. So we're here. Skip past everything, seen the hash, and we move and right. So we're here now. Now that we're here, we need to enter the transition for us to be ready to mark the second half of the word. What we're going to do then is simply uh, skip past anything uh, that's been marked uh, previously. And if we, only if we see an A... Uh, do we want to mark, right? So if we see an A as our first unmarked symbol, we want to mark it and move left. Now we need to reset the head, right? So we've marked a new symbol. So we're here, maybe I'll write it this way. We've done x, 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 a, x, 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 a, put a b here, right? So here we skip packs, pass, we've, we, we want to reset ourselves to the first unmarked symbol in the first part of the word. Where we here, we just marked the symbol x, for example. Now we want to go back and put ourselves on this a. We're going to skip past all the marks, use the hash to know that we're on the, a new part of the word, Skip past all the unmarks. Use the hash to know that we're in the first part of the word. Skip past all the unmarks until we see the first marked, and then go back one. That's going to get us on the right, on the right path. So the way we're going to do that is I'm going to say, OK, we're, we need a first. We're here. Well, we're here, we need to skip past all these marks. So read x, write x, move left. Uh, then if we see the hash, we need to change state. So I'm going to do it this way. If we see the hash, uh, write the hash, move left. So we've written this a here, skipped all the, ha skipped all the marked, seen the hash, and then moved left. So now we're on the first unmarked. So now what we want to do is skip all of the uh, unmarked symbols, because we're not on them yet. We need to get to the first one. Right? And as soon as we see a marked symbol, so if we see an x, we're going to write that x back. And then we're not going to move left, though. We're going to move right. So we're going to go like this. We're going to go, at, we're at this x, skip to the marked, see the hash, skip to the unmarked until we get to this x. We've moved left off the last unmarked to this x. And now we've read the x. We're writing the x back and then just moving left by one. 
That's what this transition uh, takes us to. Now, where does this go? We've now reset ourselves to the main head. So what do we do? Well, we reset the procedure. So sort of kind of like a recurrence and a loop, we do this. So that's what that one is. I'm going for the bottom, I'm simply going to copy the top. So if the top branch is taken, we saw an A. The bottom branch is taken, we saw a B. It's really the only difference. This is what I mean by keeping track of in the states. So I'm just I'm quite literally going to copy um, copy this. Read an A, write an A, move right. Read a B, write a B, move right. Unless we see the hash, write that hash back. Keep moving right. Uh, skipped over, skip over all the marked. Now, if we see our first unmarked symbol has to be, it better be a B. Mark it, and then move left. Begin the moving left procedure. Um, we're almost done. We need now a um, stopping condition in our accept state, right? Well, how are we going to stop? So let's say we marked everything here. We've come back here. Um, we see the hash. But then when we move off the hash, there's nothing, uh, there's no next unmarked symbol. So we would be here. We saw the hash. We don't, there's nothing to skip past. We just see only a marked symbol and then we move right. If we're here and we move right, we're back on the hash. So if we moved right from there and back on the hash, that means we're out of words, we're out of symbols to read. So that means I'm going to do it this way. I'll go from here. If we see the hash, write the hash, uh, move right. <laughs> well, now I can do two things. I can either just move the head to somewhere safe for it to be funny, or I can just accept. So I can just accept here. Uh, I don't have a Q reject in this diagram because it's too complicated. It's, it, there's many times that the transition function has to be well-defined. For example, here, let's say I'm, I'm at the A branch, but instead of seeing A, suppose I saw B, I would reject. So I'm borrowing the implicit rejection part just so I don't have to draw in the diagram. Um, so unlike DFAs, unlike uh, NFAs, unlike even PDAs, as the, as the object has gotten more complicated, the Turing machine is more complicated than the DFA, more complicated than the NFA, more complicated than the PDA. The, the goal of the Turing machine is, is so complicated that the, that the state diagram is almost uselessly complicated, right? It's better for you to think of the high-level idea rather than have to draw out the actual state diagram. Um, so as the kind of machine has gotten more advanced, so has the diagram. But still, at the end of the day, the Turing machine is very simple. As a model of computation, it has, quite literally, you know, three instructions. It's, it's three buttons as a typewriter. Um, there is a difference, though, between a Turing machine and a DFA and NFA, a significant one. This is an example of a Turing machine which is allowed to... Uh, say yes or no. So the DFAs, NFAs, and PDAs as well are only allowed to say yes or no. They accept or reject. That's their whole job. However, a Turing machine has an advancement above those, and that is we allow it to compute in general. It doesn't just have to say yes or no. It's allowed uh, to compute. So uh, we say a function f from sigma star to sigma star, so from strings to strings, is... Uh, Turing computable or just computable. We just call them a computable functions. These are a very natural and nice class of functions. Uh, we say a function is Turing computable if uh, there exists a Turing machine. Uh, such that 
when initialized with a W on its tape, it halts uh, with f of w on its uh, tape. So we are allowing Turing machines to not simply just say yes or no, but we're allowing them to output answers. So instead of an, we're going to loosen the definition, the formal definition a little bit. Instead of just saying yes or no, we're going to allow it to do arithmetic and do all kinds of crazy things. Well, not necessarily arithmetic. We'll have to show it can do arithmetic. But we're going to allow it to do things. Uh, and then it's going to just write the answer down and then stop. And whatever is the answer it leaves on the tape is the answer uh, that we say it outputs. Right? So we say a function is computable if the machine halts on all inputs. So any word you give it, it'll always give you an answer back. And it simply just writes down the answer on the tape. That's the, that's the quite literal, the definition. And not only is this like allows us to study sort of a different kind of problem about uh, computable functions, but it also conveniently makes us, allows us to have simpler diagrams. So for example, I can make a function uh, to compute the bit flip, right? So f is a bit flip. Uh, function, right? Everyone, you can imagine what a string bit flip is. Like if it was zeros and ones, ones and zeros and so on. I'm, if I used A's and B's, B's and A's, right? So basically what I'm going to do, how would I do this, by the way, as a Turing machine? Like what would, what's the idea, high level idea? Just loop through every, like, you erase it and put it. There you go. Cool. So we're going to have some state, Q0, start state. We see an A, write a B. Move right to make sure we're moving the right way. I always get I left get, I get my left and right mixed up, right often. If we see a B, we're going to write an A move right. Now we need to stop though. The machine has to stop. We can't do this forever. So what we're going to have some stopping condition, and the stopping condition is if it sees a blank. It's going to write the blank right back, and then it's just going to arbitrarily move left. Let's say. Did I say less than my example? Make sure it lines up. We're going to call this QH. QH is just for halt. The, the computing Turing machine doesn't have to say yes or no. It just has to stop. So whether it accepts it, we can just say it accepts it, whatever. Right? It would accept all inputs then, because it computes on all inputs. But certainly this machine leaves on, its in, on the output, on the tape, it leaves the answer that we want. And we can actually do a, a small configuration example. So like, suppose we initialize the machine in configuration uh, Q0, A, B, A. Right. So configure, recall, we're at state Q0. The tape is A, B, A, and the head is pointing to the A. That's what this means. How do we, uh, what's the next step according to the transition function? We're going to read an A, write a B, and move right. So we're going to read this A, turn it to a B, and move right. That's going to look like this. Read a B, write an A, move right. Read an A, write a B, move right. Here's the part when you write your configurations that you can choose to read blanks. Like you can choose to have more leading zeros if you need to. You can choose to have leading blanks if you think if it's necessary for the configuration. Read a B, so, we, so now we read a blank, write a blank, and we're going to move left. So the halting configuration is actually going to be B, A, Q, H, A, A, B. Yeah. That. I, the last, each step is conditional. So we read, write, and move. But here when we transition to the accept state, it doesn't really matter what this L is. This could have been an R just fine, because you're already going to the accept state. You're just going to... Done. You're just going to be done. You move to prepare the next step of the computation. There is no next step of the computation here because so you're, you're done. So here, this is the final configuration. So on input A, B, A, it, it outputs uh, B, A, B. So this is uh, a sequence of, configu uh, of configurations of this machine on this input. Any questions on this part? Um, so Turing machines don't have to halt. 
right? So unlike a DFA, DFA always halts in, in the number of steps of the length of the word. It always stops. The Turing machine does not have to stop. This is the biggest difference between the Turing machine and any other comp model of computation. The PDA only accepts when it, run, when it runs out of input. Okay? PDA can't loop forever. Eventually, it has to implicitly reject or something. The Turing machine is allowed to loop. How would we do this? If we read an A, great, write the A. Move right. If we read a B, well, I'm going to write an A. Move right. If we read a blank, I'm going to write an A and move right. What does this Turing machine do? Just makes the table A's. Yeah, it just starts at the first symbol, writes an A forever. It just goes off into the sunset, running, you know, it's going to go there and it's not going to stop. There's no, not only is there no stopping condition, like literally in the program, there is no stop state, but it clearly as defined will never stop. So this obviously provably never stops. Is the tape, can the tape be infinite? Yes, tape is, so there's a difference between infinite tape and arbitrarily large tape, turns out. Uh, and this is my pet peeve, is I see this all the time. Um, but I think I'll talk about it after the break, about the difference between, does a Turing machine have infinite tape or not? I see this all the time. Um, the answer is the internet is wrong and I'm right. That's the, that's the, that's the, the, the political answer there. Okay, let's try and compute some other functions. So I mentioned arithmetic. Uh, let's do some really basic arithmetic. So we're going to try and compute the successor function. The successor function quite literally just takes in a natural number and outputs the next one. That's the definition of the successor function. So uh, let's do this. We can do this in unary and in binary. So recall that integers may have, or natural numbers may have binary encodings in ones and zeros, but they may also have uh, unary encodings. So we want to begin with like 1 to the n, I'll say x, halt with 1 to the x plus 1. So a number encoded in unary is quite literally a pile of sticks, where one stick is for each unit, right? So this is the number x represented in unary. We're just going to halt with x plus 1. We're going to do unary addition first. So unary succession, excuse me. What we're going to do is we're going to be given the pile of sticks. What we want to do is just add on to the pile of sticks. So that's actually quite simple. If we see a 1, write the 1 back and move right. We're going to skip all the way to the end. So if we see a blank, write the 1 and move, it doesn't matter, right. Would you agree that this adds a 1 to the pile of sticks? Ignore all the sticks. Find the first blank. Replace the blank with uh, a stick. What if there's no sticks? Well, it's going to be initialized to blank. So, so you're asking, is the machine initialized to the empty string? Oh, OK, right. We see a blank, and we do it there. Right? Recall that all the symbols that are past the input, we assume are just blanks. So if we, if we saw this, we would ignore these two and then just halt with this. Right? So 2 plus 1 is 3, certainly. Unary uh, is not practical, though. It's like only practical if we want to be simple. This is a simple machine. How would we do binary addition? So let's, I mean, excuse me, not binary, but binary succession. Binary successor. So what, I don't know how to spell successor. How, do, how would we, if I asked you for an algorithm, not necessarily the Turing machine, how would you give an algorithm that, given an array of bits, returns an array of bits that is plus one? We're assuming you're starting at the... Most significant bit, or the least? Ah, that's the, tr that's the, tr that's the trick. We are st starting at the most significant bit, because the machine is initialized in that way. We have to go all the way, and yes. then start. So up. we would first reset ourselves to be on the least significant bit, add one, and carry forward. That's basically it. So um, if we see a one, write the one, move right. If we see a zero, write the zero, move right. Okay. Also, it doesn't make sense, like, what is a binary number in zero represented? 
you know, we can ignore leading zeros and, and things in the input, right? Just make, make things nice for ourselves. Um, but if we see a blank, we want to write the blank back. So we're not adding to the input here. And then move left. So we're going to go chuck, 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 chuck. Oh, we're at the end of the input. Go back one. That means we're at the last symbol. Right? Um, now we're at a state that allows us that, that we begin here now at the least significant bit, starting from the most significant bit. This is a common theme with Turing machines where you can have primitive operations. Like here, we're resetting to the end of the input. And you can compose them in a way to get what you want. Right? Like kind of naturally, like programming. We're here. We want to add one. So what happens? Well, if we see a 0, well, if we see a, if we see a 0, we, have an, we add 1. And move doesn't matter, right? And we accept. We halt, right? But if we see a 1, we have to unfortunately carry it forward. So we're going to see a 1. And when you carry it forward, what I mean is like, if you have, let's say, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and you add a 1 to this, this is going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So we need to find the block of zeros that's on the, from right to left and flip them and then insert the 1 until we find it. So when we find the first 0, we insert a 1 there. But everything else we have to flip. Convince ourselves of this correctness, right? This is what happens when you bit flip. Okay, one more example. Now, a succession, oh, I, my camera was not on the thing at all. Succession is um, certainly a uh, operator, but it's not really arithmetic. Can we compute addition? So, Add of x comma y is equal to x plus y, right? That's the addition function, obviously. Um, now, here's the first caveat: is that we haven't defined computable functions that aren't uh, that take more than one argument, right? So we, but here addition takes two arguments. So what we're going to do is encode them with in a way that it looks like one argument. Okay, two a memory is like doesn't have structure. You, you add the structure onto the memory. Memory is just ones and zeros. Similar for a Turing machine, you have to say what the structure is. So implicitly, we encode this in some way. Well, And I'm going to even choose to make this easier. I'm going to even choose to encode this in unary with a delimiter. So I'm going to say we want to begin with 1 to the x hash, 1 to the y, and we want to output 1 to the x plus y with no hash. So begin with two numbers, end with one number. What is it? Unary addition is actually surprisingly simple. What is an algorithm? What is a Turing machine that can do perform unary addition for us? Delete the hash. Okay. Yeah, we're going to replace the delimiter with a little bit of like memalloc, malloc trickery here. We're just going to re replace the memory structure delimiter with the one. We see a 1, write the 1, move right. We see the hash, write a 1, and move left. Doesn't matter. I'm sure I got that correct. 300. I think so. Let me make sure. I call it the two numbers, and then I will also plus 1. Yeah, x plus y plus 1. Correct. Correct. How do we fix this? Make that final state. Or like replace that last one with a zero. With exactly. Yeah. Replace the last one. We don't want to replace some other one because there will be a blank there. And then you'll have like the input split or separate or weird. We want to replace the last one. So what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we see a one. We want to keep moving right then. We see the ones. We write the ones. And we move right until we see the blank. Then we write. Then we write the blank back and move left. Then um, we see a one, and that one has to be the last one. So that's the extra one that we want to get rid of. We're going to write that to a blank, and move doesn't matter here. Yeah, there we go. 
So this is addition in unary. So first off, first day of class, somebody mentioned like DFAs, what are the limitations? It doesn't appear that they can do arithmetic. It appears with some consideration on the data structure that the Turing machine can do arithmetic, com 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 computation wise. Um, I would convince yourself that a Turing machine could do binary addition, but I don't want to do it because it would be really big like that example, right? But you could probably believe it's true. Okay, I have just some definitions for us and then we can take our break. So I'm gonna leave the definition of a computable function up here because that's important. But um, We say a language, L, is uh, Turing decidable or, uh, or just decidable. This is also called recursive. This recursive notation is like ancient. Like people call these languages recursive. It's I mean, it's, it's quite literally ancient. Nobody, only old people call it recursive, but because the word recursive means many things now to us. But uh, it unfortunately came first before any, any recursion you may have seen in, any, in like programming or anything, right? Um, so a language is decidable if there exists a Turing machine M uh, such that M on input uh, W uh, accepts if and only if uh, W is an L. And M on input uh, W uh, rejects if and only if uh, W is not an L. So a language is decidable. We say a language is decidable if there exists a Turing machine to decide it. This is the word decidable that we've used for DFAs, NFAs, PDAs, and so on, right? The machine, the machine correctly says yes on all the good words and no on all the bad words. <coughs> However, for Turing machines, we have two notions. So we're going to repeat, and this is true for all W in sigma star. The Turing machine that is a decider, decides a language, has to halt on all inputs. Um, I'm going to repeat this definition, and then we say a language L is Turing recognizable. So a language is it's also called just recognizable. I'm just going to call these recognizable. Or simply, these are also called recursively numerable. So these are the recursively enumerable languages, also an old term. We're just going to call them the recognizable languages. The, we say a language is Turing recognizable if, uh, for all W in sigma star, there exists a Turing machine, a Turing machine M, uh, such that M on input uh, W accepts if and only if uh, W is an L. M on input a W uh, rejects or loops if and only if uh, W is not an L. So what is the definite? What is the difference between these two definitions? Right, a decider, a Turing machine, which is this decider, always has to say yes, always has to say no. Okay, a Turing machine, which is just a recognizer has to always say yes if the answer is correct. But if the answer was, if the, if the answer was wrong, it's allowed to plead the fifth. We allow it to loop on some inputs, right? So this is the, this, this is the, uh, 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 the difference between these two definitions. It's very important. Here, the recognizer is allowed to loop some of the time when it's wrong. We allow it to, make inf to get stuck in an infinite loop. But if the answer is supposed to be right, if it's supposed to say, let's say, let's suppose 
the, the question is like, let's say L is like the language, is, is a language for prime numbers, okay? It's test, and so M is a decider, it's testing primality. If the number was prime, it's always supposed to say yes. But if the number was composite, we allow it to go into an infinite loop. Might not be, it's of course not the best programming if you have a program which gets stuck in an infinite loop a few times on some inputs. That's not good. But just by the definition, we allow it. This is what it means for a, recogni for a, recogniz for a recognizer. And of course, these are two definitions with respect to languages, and then we have a definition of computable functions with respect to the, the functions. All the, the definition of a computable function, though, is that the machine halts on all inputs. So the, uh, there's three definitions here that are floating around. The, the computable function, a machine that computes a computable function must halt on all inputs. What would you guys say is the relationship between decidable and recognizable languages? Just given the definition. The recognizable are a little more powerful because they have kind of some error, like they're, they'll, they'll allow it. So the way I would have worded that is that every, rec every decidable language is recognizable. If it, if it, this one accepts and rejects, it always halts. Always halts, that's important. This one accepts and rejects, but it, it's allowed to loop. So um, another word for this, by the way, is also, these are also sometimes called semi-decidable. That's an even more unpopular uh, notation, but it does exist out there. Every decider is a recognizer. Is every recognizer a decider? There are, do exist machines which may loop on some inputs. Maybe we just force the machine instead of accepting. Suppose, suppose that we design the machine such that instead of rejecting, we just say, go into an infinite loop. Certainly, we've converted a decider to a recognizer. And that dis but it's not obvious to us yet, is every decidable, is every recognizable language, like suppose we have a language which has a recognizer, so it's recognizable. There exists a machine which perhaps it loops on some inputs. Does there exist a different equivalent machine which halts on all inputs? This is going to take us a week to answer, it turns out. Uh, very complicated question. Let's take our little break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about the importance of the Turing machine.